Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back with you again. And just can I say a big thank you to Merville for taking the services while I was off uh, and for his faithfulness uh, in the messages that he proclaimed. Can I ask you also to pray for Merville at the moment? Uh, Merville's not very well. Uh, he's in hospital with pancreatitis. Uh, so do remember him uh, and remember the family in your prayers, please. At, we meet this evening at 7 p.m. in Middle Church for the first of our three uh, summer evening services. So 7 p.m. Middle Church this evening. And the Mwangi prayer letter, the latest one, is on the table at the back and in the porch. Uh, just please pick a, uh, a copy up on your way out. Um, Craft Club will meet uh, on Tuesday night at 7.30. And then he has asked me to announce uh, the European Heritage Open Day, which is approaching. It's the 10th of September. If anyone would be willing to give uh, an hour to help on the day uh, at Middle Church, please do speak to Edith after the service. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn, Blessed Assurance. Please be seated. We join together in the service of Holy Communion. As we do so, let's join together in the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. And write these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. 
the collect for today, the eighth Sunday after Trinity. Blessed are you, O Lord, and blessed are those who observe and keep your law. Help us to seek you with our whole heart, to delight in your commandments, and to walk in the, glo in, in the glorious liberty given to us by your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading for this morning is from Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning at, at verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. But those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of man, or if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if, you live, but if by the Spirit uh, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Here ends our epistle. Would you please stand for the gospel? Our gospel reading is from John chapter 14, uh, beginning at verse 25. All of this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you will be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Here ends 
our gospel reading. As we remain standing, uh, we profess our faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we say together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, as we come to your word, speak into our hearts and our lives, Lord, I pray that we may hear your voice and, and acknowledge your rights and your authority in our lives. Lord, help us to submit to you day by day, to rely on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. In this chapter, Paul is concluding what has been a large section from the beginning to up to this point uh, in his letter to the Romans, where he has been detailing uh, the sanctification of the believer in relation to the law and as the people of God. <coughs> Therefore, as such, he needs to deal with the crux of the matter for us as Christians. That is our assurance, where our trust is as believers, both in the life that we live now and equally in the life that we will know in the future of eternity. Assurance is essential. Assurance gives us peace in many and varied situations in our lives. And assurance is something that we crave. When we're very small, we crave the assurance and that security in our home from our mum and dad who love us no matter what we do. As we get older, yes, of course, the relationships change, but we still crave assurance in the midst of a loving relationship and relationships of those who are closest to us. Looking into the future, of course, we make arrangements in our lives so that we have assurance that everything will be okay as we look into the days and the years ahead. We, make, we take out insurance policies to protect our possessions and our houses. We take out life assurance policies. We make wills. Assurance is something that is important because it does give us that peace that our lives and our hearts require. The big question is, of course, when is that assurance real? And when is it more than correctly a false hope that will lead ultimately to the loss of all that we hold dear? In scripture, you only have to think of the foolish rich farmer building his bigger barns, thinking to himself that he's got everything sorted for years to come, when in fact the one thing that he had forgotten about in his planning was God. The assurance that he thought he had was all taken away from him, where he lost everything, including his life. Leaving God out of the picture of our lives is a dangerous thing to do, because we indulge in that our sinful nature more and more. 
However, as we think about this chapter of Romans, we need to remember Paul is addressing the people who do know the Lord, who know Jesus, who know the reality of his death in their lives. And so he reminds them of the realities. He's pressing home the assurance that we know as Christians in Christ Jesus. The assurance of eternity. As we think about this passage, there are three points we need to consider. Firstly, in Christ there is no condemnation. Verses 1 to 4. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. The people of Paul's day, as with each successive generation, have had to deal with the realities of the struggles of life. Struggles from the world around us and struggles from within that come from our own sinful natures. Under grace, we're called to trust. To trust Christ for strength to stand strong and in trusting Christ to know the hope of the future that we have in him. Because in Christ, our trust rests fully on the promises of the word of God. Confidence, though, because we're fickle, can be a subjective thing. When everything is going well, we feel good and we feel confident. <coughs> the question is, in the midst of all of that, where is our actual confidence based? It has to be on the word of God. If it's on us, we're on shaky ground. We need to rely on God's grace to be able to help us in the good times, but equally too when life is tough. It's very easy to reach a position whereby we say to ourselves, I will make myself better. I will do better. I will try harder. I will stop giving in to whatever tempts me. The danger is at that point that we've stopped relying on God's grace and we're not trusting God. Rather, we're looking inwardly rather than upwardly. And we have adopted a dual confidence, if you like. A confidence, yes, in God for some things, but equally a confidence in our own abilities to cope. We need to get the balance right. So instead, we need to rely on God's grace and on the true confidence that is in Christ Jesus alone. The reality that Paul points to here in verse 1 is a summary in that sense of Paul's letter so far to the Romans. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the cross means we are justified by faith. As we trust in all that Jesus did at that cross at Calvary. Because of Jesus, as we trust in his death, we are saved. We are rescued through faith in the one who died. He received the condemnation we deserve as sinners before God. Therefore, Paul can say with confidence, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The work of Christ has dealt with the problem of the law for us. The law that Paul has been discussing in many of the chapters so far. You see, the law was good. But because of our weakness, the law became a problem to us. A problem that was insurmountable. The Lord did what we couldn't by sending his son to be the perfect sacrifice for us. In our flesh, dying for our sin. In the flesh of the Son dying on the cross, our slave master, sin, has been completely and utterly defeated and condemned. 
which is why Paul can say emphatically, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That, of course, must have implications on how we live. The work of Christ must change us. It must change our situation. And therefore, the work of Christ must continue to change our situation of our lives lived because of the cross, through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The cross for us can never just be one moment in time. It's a daily reality for us, day by day, as we die to sin and live for Christ. He died once and for all so that we don't have to. That brings us to our second point, therefore. On your mind and in your body. These are the outworkings for us on the daily basis. What we focus on in our thoughts and what we do. The purpose of the cross was to enable us, as sin is dealt with once and for all, to live by the Spirit rather than to live by our sinful nature. The work of Christ changes us. We are saved to go to heaven, but more than that, we're saved so that the law would be kept in our living. We cannot do that by ourselves, but through the cross and in the spirit, we are enabled to be faithful. This is the conscious decision that we need to make every day. That in, that as the Spirit dwells within us, we choose to be holy. We choose to be faithful. Making godly choices in our lives. Living out those godly choices as we continue to walk in the Spirit of Christ under the Word of God. The rule of the Holy Spirit needs to be recognised in our lives, therefore. Because with the help of the Spirit, we are transformed from condemned humanity of Adam to the justified humanity of Christ. Therefore, by walking in with the Spirit in union with Christ, we can actually begin, begin to do the right thing under the law. Our conscience tells us the law. And in that, through Christ, through Christ alone, we can live it out. In that sense, Paul moves in these verses from the fact of our justification to the reality of our justification. That is how we live our lives. But Paul touches on something vitally important in all of this. The relationship of living either to the Spirit or to sin. What is it that controls us? I don't think it's a mistake that Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And his summary of the law, in submitting to Jesus, we need to hand everything over to him, our body and our mind, everything that we are, so that he is honored, so that in our minds, the Holy Spirit would continue day by day to have his way. There isn't a position of neutrality for us. There isn't a fence to sit on on this one. Because the battle that we face is constant. It is a spiritual battle that we live out as Christians. We all know that during the Second World War, in the midst of war in Europe, there were certain countries such as Switzerland, who opted out and said, we want to be neutral. We're not part of this war. Well, in the spiritual battle that we face as believers, between the flesh and the spirit, we don't have an option of neutrality. The reality is, Paul is, says, the life of the flesh is a life that doesn't acknowledge nor submit to God. So it's a life that we need to reject. So as we have submitted to Christ and the cross, at that point, 
as we accept him as our Lord and as our Saviour. So we need to continue to do that day by day, submitting to God, walking in the Spirit day by day. This is what Paul says in verses 9 through to 12. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. But if, the, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. We are united with Christ in his death. Our bodies, in that sense, are dead to sin with Christ. In the power of the Spirit, therefore, he, he, we will be raised to eternal life. And that brings us to our final point. Because Paul um, has talked about the reality that in Christ we're no longer condemned. Because he has taken our condemnation for us. And as such has saved people and given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit, to fulfill God's purposes for the rest of our lives. So then he outlines some of those family benefits that we know as a saved people in verse 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. It's no small thing to say that we are adopted children of God and that we are heirs to the promise of an eternity with God and co-heirs with Christ. Our assurance in this is in the promise that we see in John 3 and verse 36 where Jesus says to us, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. The question is, as time passes, do we take that for granted? As something that was meaningful at one point in our lives, but which is swamped by the familiar, familiarity of the words. John's Gospel and Paul's letter to the Galatians is helpful in this. As God's children, we need to be a people connected to the Saviour. Remember in John's Gospel, he talks about the vine. We need to remain part of Jesus, the vine, connected to him, undergoing regular pruning so that we're, we're always alive and fresh in him. As such his promise and who we are in him will always be real to us. And therefore, as Paul says to the Galatians, we need to be a fruitful people displaying the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, growing and living a life that points to and witnesses to the love, our love for the Saviour and our hope of eternity as his children. And so Paul says here in Romans 8 and verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This, this is our great assurance Outlined first here by Paul so far in Romans 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because in Christ we are transformed as spirit-filled people. With the hope of an inheritance with Christ. The question is, can you say that for yourself this morning? Is that the reality of your life today? Do you have that assurance in Christ? And as such, is your life a witness to the fact that you have been adopted as God's child? It's a question of knowing it and living it. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. 
Father, we thank you for your word of truth to us. Lord, help us to understand and to apply the promises of your word, to live out your word day by day, that others may know more of you too. Help us to be faithful in our witness. Help us to be faithful in our walk. And help us to know with that absolute certainty that in Christ Jesus there is now no condemnation for those who trust in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing uh, our second hymn, In Christ Alone. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations, and to receive these our prayers which we offer under thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth unity and concord, and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. And we beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes and governors, and especially thy servant Elizabeth our Queen, that under her we may be godly and quietly governed, and grant under her whole counsel, and to all who are put in authority under her, that they may truly and impartially minister justice the punishment of wickedness and vice, 
and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and clergy, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and living word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. I'm going to stand to sing again our final hymn, uh, Take Time to Be Holy. Let's conclude this part of our service by saying together the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>